good evening and a uh, very warm welcome to the black hole uh, from the mysteries of neural networks to understanding the basics of uh, brain functioning uh, let's discuss the fundamental concepts of neuroscience in an accessible and engaging manner uh, for beginners uh, we are very grateful to our speaker dr mriganka sur he is the newton professor of neuroscience and director of the Simon Center for the Social Brain at MIT. Uh, earlier, he remained chairperson of the Department of Neurosciences at MIT. Uh, his research interest is in the cerebral cortex, circuits, plasticity, dynamics, and brain disorders. Uh, we are very grateful to we are very grateful to Dr. Pravesh Hudbhai as well, who will moderate today's session. Uh, please do us a favor and turn your cell phones to silent mode. When the house is open for Q and A, uh, we would like you to participate and make this an engaging conversation. But please raise your hand first and speak only after having this microphone in your hand. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Dr. Mriganka Sur for neuroscience for beginners. Thank you. आज आप एक बहुत बड़े साइंटिस्ट से मिलने वाले हैं डॉक्टर मृगंग का सुर एम में होते हैं मैं इनसे पता नहीं बीस तीस साल पहले मिला था मुझे कुछ इतना ख़ास नहीं पता था लेकिन अब जबकि न्यूरो साइंस में मेरी थोड़ी सी दिलचस्पी बढ़ी है तो मैंने देखा कि वाकई कितना बड़ा काम इन्होंने किया है तो वो तो समझाएँगे आपको अपनी अपने तरीके से लेकिन जो मैंने थोड़ा सा समझा है ना उसके बारे में मैं थोड़ा सा बताता हूँ आपको तो कोई सा भी आप कंप्यूटर लें कोई मैक हो या लेनोवो हो या जो भी तो उसके अंदर चिप्स हैं और उन चिप्स के अंदर सर्किट्स हैं और सर्किट्स के अंदर तारे हैं और जिस वक्त वो कंप्यूटर बनता है तो वो सब कुछ तय हो जाता है और जैसे जैसे वक्त गुजरता है वो उस कंप्यूटर की ताकत या उसकी जो केपेबिलिटीज हैं उसमें कोई कमी पेशी नहीं होती अब लोग यही समझते थे इंसानी दिमाग के बारे में कि पैदाइश के वक्त जो हमें विरसे में मिलता है जो दिमाग की साख्त होती है उस वक्त वो हमेशा तक वैसे ही रहेगा लेकिन अब एक बड़ी दिलचस्प बात सामने आई है कि दिमाग में जिस जिसको ये लोग प्लास्टिसिटी कहते हैं वो चीज़ है मतलब ये के वक्त के साथ साथ दिमाग की साख्त बदलती जाती है और नए कनेक्शंस उसके अंदर बनते हैं नए न्यूरल सर्किट्स बनते हैं अब ये एग्जैक्टली exactly किस तरह से बनते हैं और इसमें कौन से सेल्स इन्वॉल्व हैं और जो तारे हैं एक्सॉन्स जो कहलाती हैं वो कैसे अपना रुख बदलती हैं ये जानना इन न्यूरो साइंटिस्ट का काम है तो मेरी गांग का आज आपको इसके बारे में बताएंगे आइए हम उस उनकी स्वागत करते हैं तो मेरे गांग का कैन यू हेयर मी यस ओह ग्रेट 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 सो दे बी एबल टू सी यू इन जस्ट ट्वेंटी सेकेंड्स एंड आई एल मूव ऑफ टू द साइड ओवर हेयर वी विल जस्ट बी एबल टू सी यू बिकॉज द प्रोजेक्टर हैज बीन टर्न ऑन and indeed there you are <laughs> looking very cheerful today although it's morning time <laughs> yeah so uh, before well, we begin let me ask you one question is bothers me a little bit you know you are famous for neuroplasticity but uh, plasticity means that uh, deformations are easily possible in the brain but uh, this is what we call in physics elasticity elasticity is the exact opposite of plasticity so why do you call it plasticity not elasticity <laughs> i i i don't know the roots of the word but we call plasticity as opposed to specificity or hard wiring because is the capacity for change the capacity for being plastic this has been historically used in psychology or when we refer to our children the brain is plastic i don't i don't know why it is not elastic elastic gives the impression of stretch 
plastic gives the impression of mold. Yeah, but plasticity is also about brittleness and, you know, you bend it too much, it cracks. I see. Oh, yeah. we don't think of it that way. I see. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to interrupt you. Uh, tell us where neuroscience sure. is going. Tell us about the basics because people over here aren't uh, very knowledgeable. I, I certainly am not, so I'm hoping to learn a lot from you today. Well, thank you very much, Parvez. Thank you for inviting me. Parvez, you said that if we can tell in Hindustani, it will be better. But I will be in the USA next year for 50 years. यहाँ पे आए हुए हैं तो हमारी हिंदुस्तानी बिल्कुल वीक होती जा रही है और हमें उर्दू तो कभी आती नहीं थी अब और और हमारी हिंदी भी बहुत कमजोर है अब भाई आप तो बहुत अच्छी बोल रहे हैं I will do my best and you know science में scientific terms are in English so it's much easier for me to just describe in English मगर यदि किसी को समझ में नहीं आ रहा है तो आप हमें रोक लीजिए और और हमें फिर से पूछिए कि आपने क्या बताया क्योंकि देखिए आप इतनी दूर से आए हैं और मैं भी यहाँ से बता रहा हूँ तो so so I would like that everybody understands what I'm saying great okay? all right yeah so I'm going to spend about maybe twenty minutes telling you a little bit about what we know about the brain today. And even how do we know it? Because science is something that is learned by interaction, by, by experimentation, and then by building theories and concepts. So it is as important to understand how we know as it is to understand what we know. And so my goal will be to continuously emphasize how we know something about the brain, which is a very difficult place to study. You know, brain hamare dimag ke andar, hamare hamare sar ke andar hai, usko aap kaise so sakte hai, samaj sakte, usko aap chhu nahi sakte. Magar phir bhi, jo bhi aap abhi dek rahe hai, sun rahe hai, samaj rahe hai, wo aap ke brain ke liye, brain se hai. So, isko samaj na bahut zaruri hai. Logan ne kaha hai ki the brain is the last great frontier of science. Jaise astrophysics hai, physics hai, physics mein itni hum chiz hai, hum jankari hui hai. Parvez sahab ne discover kiya hai. Aur, aur bhi kitni sciences hai, chemistry hai, aur biology, genes, aur cells kaise bante hai. Magar brain ek aisi chiz hai. जगह है जो कि बहुत ही डिफिकल्ट है स्टडी करना मगर हमने इसके बारे में काफी जानकारी की है लास्ट 10-20 सालों में इन पर्टिकुलर दो पीपल हैव थॉट अबाउट द ब्रेन फॉर सेंचुरी सदियों से हमने सोचा है हमारे फिलोसोफर्स ने बुजुर्गों ने कि ये क्या है हम क्यों ऐसे सोचते हैं हम कैसे यू नो रिमेंबर हाउ डू वी लर्न हाउ डू वी रिमेंबर नाउ वी हैव सम आइडिया so my goal is to share some of this progress with you. So, 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 so I will slides I share karunga or shuru karte hai first. Achha, slides dekh raha hai aapko? Uh, Parvez, can you see my no, slides? No, uh -huh, abhi, abhi aaya. Okay, now, now we are, okay. Now we can see okay. neuroscience for beginners. And yes, right. okay, you can yes. see my slides, yeah. but you can't see me, right? I can't see you, yeah. Okay, that's fine. That, that's okay with me. All right. As long as you can hear me, that's fine. Action. So, let me see. Huh. So, the human brain is a massively powerful processing machine. And the human brain, we all know something about it. We know where it is. It's in our head. Some of us use it, that was a joke. Uh, 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 but what is the, one of the most remarkable things about the brain is that it has so many cells. A cell is a fundamental unit of life. 
within which live genes and within which live molecules and there are trillions and trillions of cells in our body but the human brain has 80 billion cells and it is the activity of these cells that creates the mind. It's an amazing thing. It's a physical object, yet it creates ideas, it creates thought, it creates memories which you cannot see, which you cannot touch, yet they are real. And, and that, is the, that is the mystery and the beauty of neuroscience. So the mind is a colloquial term for what we call cognition. You know, cognition is mental action or processes of acquiring knowledge and understanding through thought, through experience and the senses. This is the definition from the Oxford English Dictionary. But the mind is the product of the brain. Cognition is the product of the brain. That is why we have a brain. Every animal has some semblance of cognition. We may not call it consciousness, though we do not know what consciousness is. But commonly, cognition refers to all kinds of mental activity, underlying perceiving. Jaise aap bete hain, aap dekh rahe hain. Aap, aap, aap meri slides dekh rahe hain. Isse vision begins with photons coming from my slide into your eyes, and then your brain interpreting that slide through the electrical activity of your brain. It is an amazing thing. When you are hearing me, sound waves from the speaker in your room are entering your ears. They are creating vibrations along the cochlea, and those vibrations get converted into electrical impulses. That electricity is going from your ear to your brain. And then there are brain areas that are interpreting just these vibrations or these photons as language or as vision. And then I hope from this talk you will understand something. You will learn something. And as Parvez just said, it will mean your brain has changed. There is no way you can learn or you can remember or you can understand or develop an understanding without changes in the brain. So our brain is constantly changing, constantly changing. Yet it is stable because it is not as if what you see today, you will not see tomorrow. You will still see the room, your car, your friends, your family as they are. Yet you will learn a little bit more, perhaps about them, perhaps from my talk, perhaps about your own brain. So your brain will have changed. And the challenge of neuroscience is to both understand this stability and its plasticity, as we have just learned. So cognition also refers to attention, something very profound. Like you are sitting, you are probably the heat is going on, maybe Parvez is doing something or doing something else. But hopefully, your attention is being attended to us, what is happening in our slide. इसका मतलब आपने दस चीजों पे आपने नजर नहीं दिया है आप एक चीज पे नजर दे रहे हैं दैट इज अ वेरी प्रोफाउंड कंपोनेंट ऑफ ऑफ कॉग्निशन कम्युनिकेशन हम आपके साथ बातचीत कर रहे हैं डिसीशन एक्शन सोशल इंटरेक्शन इवन एम्पथी द एबिलिटी टू फील पेन द एबिलिटी टू एम्पथाइज और टू फील समबडी एल्स इज पेन दिस इज अ वेरी ह्यूमन कैटेगरी एंड ऑल दिस इज मेड पॉसिबल बाय द ब्रेन and the mind. And we have consciousness in quotes because this is a difficult subject. So how is it that the brain does this? So this is for this. Parvez, you have told us that computers are in the way of the brain and not. So the brain is often compared to a computer. We say that uh, a, a, a brain hamesha se has been compared to the most advanced machine. Brain ko clockwork kaha karte the, brain ko engine kaha karte the, aur ab brain ko computer karte hain. Aur ye dekhiye, ye hai chip, sabse latest chip hai NVIDIA ki, jisse iski itni capacity hai, itni power hai, 900 gigabits per second. Se ye, ye information uh, 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 transmit karta hai. Aur 500 gigabits per second ki iski bandwidth hai, etc, etc. So, brain to humare iske saamne kuch bhi nahi ki zi taras, ek taras hai. 
So computers do many things better than humans. Computers can multiply, you know, two, you know, 10 digit numbers before I can even read out two of those digits, Jesse. Or the computer can recognize, you know, images. The computer can do this or that, do word processing. Or most recently, computers ne ye uh, 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 artificial intelligence uh, 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 software hai program hai Chat GPT. Aapne shayad suna hoga. Chat GPT hai Chat Generative Pre-trained Transformer. Ek ye machine learning algorithm hai. Ye bahut bari program hai. Jisse ki aap computer ke saath baat kar sakte hain. Aap aap usse sawal puchiye, wo computer aapko answer karega. Or it's amazing. आप 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 कहिए कि कंप्यूटर हमें एक प्रोग्राम लिख दीजिए जिससे कि हम यह कर सकें या वो कर सकें. So within large, uh, uh, you know, areas, the Chat GPT will do that. ये कैसे करता है? Chat GPT इसके बारे में हम यदि आप हमें क्वेश्चन पूछे तो हम बतला सकते हैं. It requires massive amounts of data. इत पूरी दुनिया में जितना डेटा है सब कंप्यूटर्स को वो मिला के उससे ये statistical relationship ढूंढता है और इसके लिए massive computing power चाहिए और इस statistical relationship से ये chat GPT काम करता है and it, and it seems intelligent आप यदि chat GPT के साथ कभी interact करें तो आप देखेंगे amazing मगर इसको बतलाया गया है it is a stochastic pattern इसका क्या मतलब है कि क्या ये समझता है या खाली next word or next word statistically ढूंढ सकता है और आपको बतला सकता है so मेरे ख्याल से तो the brain does not work this way even though chat gpt has tremendous strength the brain does not work this way the brain is wired during development and it changes constantly in order to build and gather and store and use information the brain develops understanding of the world. The, the key word is understanding. And, you know, it has been famously said, data is not knowledge, and knowledge is not understanding. So understanding how the brain works is very, is, 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 is at the core of neuroscience. Why should we study neuroscience? Because understanding the brain will help us understand ourselves. Of course, the brain is what makes us human. It what gives us our capacity. We will be able to understand and treat brain disorders and diseases. Yadi, by the end of my talk, yeah, if in the questions you ask me about how are we making progress on understanding brain disorders and diseases, I can tell you a little bit. It's a very long road. It's a very difficult area of study, unlike other areas which in which we have made progress, heart disease, yeah, cancer even. And understanding the brain may help us build the next generation of machines. We have intelligence in court because there is a real debate that can machines be really intelligent in the way that you and I or human beings are in terms of understanding the world, having common sense, interacting with each other in a rich way. So, we will tell you about brain. Brain brain structure, brain function, और कैसे जानते हैं हम ब्रेन के बारे में सो so, ब्रेन की यदि आप सेक्शन लें तो ये आप कोई टेक्स्ट बुक में देख सकते हैं मगर हम खाली एक एक या दो स्लाइड दिखाएंगे सो द ब्रेन में देयर आर मेनी डिस्टिंक्ट रीजंस एंड ईच ऑफ दीस रीजंस जैसे ये सेरिब्रल कॉर्टेक्स है सबसे बाहर का जो लेयर है और फिर उसके अंदर कनेक्शंस है उसके अंदर तमाम सारे रीजंस हैं उनके नाम ये है ये, ये नाम आपको जानने की जरूरत नहीं हमने बत बतलाया हुआ है कि सालों से 100 200 साल से हम ब्रेन को स्टडी कर रहे हैं अलग-अलग तरीके से माइक्रोस्कोप के नीचे डाल सकते हैं देख सकते हैं कि ये रीजन इज डिफरेंट फ्रॉम दैट रीजन फिर उसके बाद हम मेजरमेंट्स कर सकते हैं कि कौन की किस रीजन की की कनेक्शन किसके साथ है तो इतने तमाम सारे रीजन हैं बट इंपॉर्टेंटली ये रीजन सब एक किस्म के नहीं है each of these regions has unique function. Its function is different. One region is here caudate nucleus. Its function is to move or to, to help move. Or our cerebral cortex function is to help perceive or dis, 
or make decisions or planning, etc. And different parts of the cerebral cortex have different functions. Or brain is made up of neurons, or neurons ke alawa bhi or kisan ke cells hain, astrocytes karke itself. But neurons are the critical element of brain cells. Or just say, this region may, yadi aapko blow up kare, to so saal pehle Ramon Ikahal, ek Spanish neuroanatomist hua karte the. To unho ne brain ki sections karke, human brain or bohat kizam ke janwaru ki brain ki section you know, karke, unho ne describe kiya ki uski structure kya hai. Or iske liye unko Nobel Prize mila, kyunki ye sab se pehli description thi, कि ब्रेन में डिस्क्रीट सेल्स हैं जिसका नाम है न्यूरॉन्स और ये न्यूरॉन्स इस तरीके से दिखते हैं और अब हम 100 साल बाद न्यूरॉन्स को लेबल कर सकते हैं इसमें जैसे कहते हैं फ्लोरेसेंट मार्कर्स और जेनेटिक इंजीनियरिंग से हम चूहे के ब्रेन में फॉर एग्जांपल हर सेल में हम अलग-अलग किस्म का रंग करके हम उसको देख सकते हैं कि उसकी उसकी स्ट्रक्चर क्या है so structural understanding से हम ये देख सकते हैं कि brain में कितनी complexity है, different किस्म के cells हैं, ये cells एक दूसरे के साथ connect करते हैं, ये long distance connections हैं, wires हैं, इस तरीके से brain में circuits हैं, और ये, ये so already आप समझ रहे हैं कि किस किस लिए brain को computer के साथ compare किया गया है, जैसे computers में में transistors हैं circuits बनते हैं ये circuits से information processing होती है similarly brain की खासियत ये है कि brain processes information via brain cells that are wired up into circuits so ये information processing कैसे होता है what is how does it become possible तो इसके लिए ये neuron क्या neuron कैसे काम करता है so neuron is ke liye bhi nobel prize diye gaye hain neuron ki khasiyat ye hai neuron brain cell hai aur ye aap dekh sakte hain ye 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 this has been this is a drawing but it represents a 10000 fold magnification 80 billion cells hain to ek cell is 100 the width of your of a human hair aap yadi baal nikal le to uska 100 jitna hoga that is one neuron so that is why you have 80 billion of them packed into a volume of one liter or or or, 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 or brain ki weight about one kilogram because 90 percent of the brain cells are made up of water but the other 10 percent is the special cell membrane and molecules or brain cells ki, ki do khasiyat hain ek hai ki the brain cell generates electrical spikes Brain cells may ye membrane hai or ye bahar sodium hai under potassium ions hai or jab electrical action potential hota hai jete yaan dek rahe hai us wo action potential brain ke zuban aap jo bhi sun rahe hai abhi jo bhi dek rahe hai jo bhi soch rahe hai it is only possible kyunki aapke brain mein electric action potential aapke brain ke neurons action potential bana rahe hai or her cheese represented by this action potentials or action potential ki ye khasiyat hai ki this action potentials ki height ek hi hoti hai unki interval unki spacing kitni baar ek second mein fire karta hai that is the information code so this information code of single neurons is a very profound aspect of brain function and it is the job of neuroscience to understand not only how is this action potential made but how do they code information and represent information? If there is one sentence summary of the field of neuroscience, it is this. So how is action potential made though? This is Leah Hodgkin and Huxley got Nobel Prize in 1954. Uh, 54 mein, uh, uh, 1960, their paper came in 1954, about 60 years ago. इसमें सोडियम अंदर आता है और पोटेशियम बाहर जाता है और इस तरीके से each neuron can generate action potentials hundreds of them or, or in a many tens of them at a time compared to a digital computer जिसमें आप gigahertz से you know communication होता है मतलब 10 to the uh, uh, 12 times a second brain की speed बहुत slow है brain में 
100, maybe 200 times a second at most action potential can fire. But the amazing thing is, it is not the quantity of action potential, it is the quality ki action potential kis tarike se information convey kar raha hai. That is the important part. Second thing about, the, about brain cells is ki the brain, not only brain cells generate action potentials, but they connect to other cells via specialized junctions called synapses. So a brain cell is a discrete entity. It has a beginning and it has a wire and it has an end. It ends at the next cell. Each cell, each brain cell or neuron makes thousands of synapses with hundreds of other cells. Or yes, synapse is a very interesting and complicated uh, 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 thing. It's may electrical action potential aata hai, magar the action potential cannot go to the next cell because there is a gap. And that is what a synapse is. Synapse in Greek is derived from a Greek word mean, means junction with a gap. So, is gap ko kaise hap with a brain, uh, uh, you know, cross karega? It's may the action potential leads to a chemical transmitter release, which is taken up by receptors on the next cell, which then generates an action potential. So, electrical to chemical to electrical again transmission. And this synapse is a very complicated you know, structure. It's may 1000 sebi zyada genes or uski proteins hain. Yeah, synapse is the absolute central to brain function and plasticity. Yadi each neuron connected physically to another neuron to another neuron, there is no potential for change. One spike in neuron one will lead to one spike in neuron two, which will lead to one spike in neuron three. But it is not so in the brain. When one spike in neuron one happens, neuron one may or may not, or in some conditional way speak to neuron 2 because of this chemical transmission and this is the source of brain information processing so brain is brain information is coded by spikes but then processed by synapses and these hundreds of synapses thousands of synapses by each cell there are a thousand trillion synapses in the brain because of 80 billion cells making thousands of synapses. This is the source of information processing as well as the vast majority of our diseases are due to disorders of the synapse and due, due to synaptic dysfunction. And the synapses, of course, are the source of plasticity, of learning and memory. So very quickly, these are four. So what does all this do? How does, so, so synapses help neurons make networks and networks are groups of neurons which act together to create something new. So a thousand neurons connected to each other by synapses are much more than a thousand times one. And we see this in brain function. So here are four self portraits by a German artist called Anton Redescheid. Or Redescheid ko stroke ho gaya brain mein. When he was six, then he's now dead, but he was in his 60s and he was an artist or uski brain mein ek jaga stroke hua. Or, or stroke kya hai? Ki brain ki neurons jo hai, wo itni active hai ki un, unko oxygen or glucose ki bahut zorurat hai. In fact, the brain uses 80% of the energy of our body. And it is only two pounds out of a human being who may be 120, 150, 200 pounds. Yet it uses 80%. Because these are very energy intensive you know, you know, processes. Every spike requires energy for it to be generated. And there are millions and millions and millions of spikes all the time. So if the, and this energy is brought to the brain via blood vessels. So the brain has lots and lots of blood vessels, but when a blood vessel has a clot, then it creates a stroke. And when a stroke happens, then neurons are deprived of blood and hence of oxygen and glucose. So then that those brain cells stop functioning. 
and typically a brain cell can live without oxygen or glucose for only some minutes, tens of minutes at most, and then they die. And when a brain cell dies, it never usually regrows in most parts of the brain. When, 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 when you have a cut in your skin, the, the wound heals because cells on either side of your finger, of the cut, will regrow and cover the cut. Not so in the brain. So that is one of the more, also more, one of the most amazing things about the brain. So Radoshite had a stroke in what is called the right parietal cortex. Unke brain ke is jaga pe. So Radoshite stroke ke baad, wo aine mein dekhte hain apne aap ko aur apni self portrait banate hain. So ye, ye, ye pehla portrait hai yaha pe on the top left, soon after his stroke. And the next portrait is next to it. After three months, after a few months, and then another one, and then another one. And Vader Scheidt was lucky that he recovered, that even though the part of the brain that had the stroke is dead, we know what part of the brain it is. It is the part of the brain called the parietal cortex. And we know even which part of the brain, which side, it is on the right side. And how do we know this? Because Vader Scheidt looks at his, looks at the mirror, and he draws one eye and half a nose and half a mouth. The left side of his face is completely blank. It is not that he cannot see. His eyes are perfectly fine. But there is something wrong in his brain wow. in the ability to put together the elements of perception into an object, which is his face. And it tells you something remarkable. And then three months later, there is still some poverty on the left side of his face. And then three months later, and Radoshite knows there is something wrong because the rest of the brain is not sitting still. And then three months more or a few months more, and Radoshite recovers. How does he recover? Plasticity, most likely, because the parts of the brain that are normal, that were not damaged, can take on some of the lost functions. This is a remarkable example of plasticity. But it also is a remarkable example of specificity, which is unique functions in, in that jahan pe unka stroke hua, parietal cortex, in the middle of the cortex, jahan pe there is a representation of the world that is created. And this representation of the world is the basis for attention. And we now, we, we know that what, what Radoshite is suffering from is called left spatial neglect. It is a classic sign of a stroke in the right parietal cortex where you can see, but you do not acknowledge it. Here is another, and so this, so there is a very important idea here that brain networks create cognition. And there are specific networks that arise in specific brain regions, such as in the parietal cortex for attention. And these networks are a representation of the world. We do not mirror the world, but we transform it for our purpose and make representations in our brain. Okay? And so here's another example here of, this is a classic example of how in the right parietal cortex, if there is a stroke, then when a patient is asked to draw a clock, he will draw only the right side of the clock. It is not that he cannot move his eyes. It is not that he cannot see, but he thinks this left world does not exist. It is an amazing thing. Or you ask him to draw or them to draw a house, he will draw half a house or a flower, half the flower. So this attentional neglect tells us that attention filters and focuses information from the world. And it's crucial for many components of cognition. I'm using it as an example to just tell you how amazingly complex and interesting the brain is that it that this th that even something that you take for granted which is attention hopefully you are listening to me or seeing my slides yeah. you are attending <laughs> it involves a phenomenally complex and interesting set of processing in your brain and it underlies perception the decisions learning and action one more example, and then I will uh, take some questions or I can tell you more if there are questions. I have many slides, but I have organized it into modules. Another example of brain function is learning and memory. 
if you remember anything at all from my talk, it is because information has gone from your eyes, from your ears, to specific brain regions that create memory and other brain regions that store that memory. And how do we know this? We know this from many uh, 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 you know, ways, but very importantly from this one man, from this one man, his, when he was alive, he was called HM. But his name, when he died after 2008, was revealed to the world. I knew about his name before that. His name is Henry Molesen. Why is this man so important in the history of neuroscience? This man was not a scientist. This man was a patient. What kind of patient? This man had seizures. You know, he had epilepsy. So when he was young, he would have seizures. So when he was 27 years old, in 1953, a neurosurgeon did an operation on him. The neurosurgeon went in to his brain. It was a very complicated operation. But he went into the brain and he removed this structure deep in the brain called the hippocampus. And this is an X-ray. It was actually a kind of a CT scan done soon after that. CT scan was, it was still early days. This was, this was done in 2007, just before he died. And you can see this gap, this quote unquote hole in the brain in this structure called the hippocampus. It turns out that after this surgery, Molesen, H.M., could not remember anything new. He remembered everything that had happened up to his surgery. But after that, he couldn't. I met him. I met him about, you know, two, three years before he died. You would meet him. You, he would say, hello, doctor, how are you? You know, somebody would introduce me. And then you go away and you come back and he has no idea who you are. If you ask him, what did you have this morning for breakfast? Or what did you have for dinner? He has no idea. It's an amazing thing. And that's because the, there is a special structure in the brain that makes memories. It's called the hippocampus, shown here. But then this memory doesn't live there. It lives elsewhere in the cortex because there is not enough space, not enough neurons, not enough synapses to store all the memories of our lifetime in just one region. So they are stored in the context of action. And we know that from many other regions. So Molesen spent 50 years of his life being a subject where he was asked this question or that question. And from Molesen, we know that human memory has unique features, that there are memories for events, places, and things. Yeah, is 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 auditorium mein baithe hain. This is a special memory for this space, for this location. But many of you know how to ride a bicycle. That is a different kind of memory. Or many of you, of all of you, can write. You can write your signature. That is a different kind of memory. It is a motor memory. So, they, so we know from Molesen, and Molesen never lost any of those. He could even acquire new motor memory. But he lost the ability to remember places, things. These are called episodic memories. So these are just a couple of ideas about how the brain does what it does. And now, so far I've told you, by just looking at people, by just talking to them, by just asking them to do things, and when certain things happen to them, a stroke or some surgery, or unfortunately, because we live in times of war and death, very sadly, when you know, there is damage to the brain, you, a neurologist or a scientist can, can decipher what do brain regions do. But we can do many, 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 many more things. And we can only do so many things with human beings because you cannot go deep into the brain. So my laboratory, for example, works with animals. And we study, we use highly sophisticated measurements of brain activity. And these are some of the tools that are used. So functional magnetic resonance imaging is used recordings from neurons at the population level, at single neurons levels, high resolution imaging methods, multi-photon imaging to look in animal brains. In my lab works with mice. 
हम चूहे के साथ काम करते हैं वाई चूहा बिकॉज उसकी हम ब्रेन बदल सकते हैं उस, उ, उसमें हम उसमें हम फ्लोरस एंड ट्रेसर्स जेनेटिक इंजीनियरिंग से कर सकते हैं और फिर हम लेजर से ब्रेन को स्कैन कर सकते हैं और देख सकते हैं कि उसमें इंफॉर्मेशन कैसे रिप्रेजेंट होता है एक, कैसे कोडिंग होती है एंड वी कैन स्टडी सिनेप्सेस इवन फाइनर एंड वी कैन स्टडी मॉलिक्यूल्स इन साइड सिनेप्सेस टू आस्क हाउ डू दिस सिनेप्सेस वर्क हाउ डू दे चेंज एंड दैट्स हाउ वी अंडरस्टैंड ब्रेन वायरिंग ब्रेन फंक्शन एंड सो दीज आर लेवल्स ऑफ एनालिसिस गोइंग डाउन फ्रॉम मिलीमीटर्स ऑफ स्केल टू sub micron scale below the resolution of visible light we can now study the brain all these levels of analysis and what have they you know told us they have told us that not only using fmri or positron emission tomography there are different regions that mediate different aspects of brain function if i show you the word car your visual cortex will light up if i speak the word car your auditory cortex will light up if i when you hear when you speak the motor cortex lights up and if you have to generate language if i say car and you say drive or you or you make sentences different parts of the language areas light up but the real questions now today are how is the brain wired how do these neurons get connected up to make the brain circuits that underlie the mind how do brain wiring and neuronal dynamic create cognition and how do changes in brain wiring lead to disorders of cognition so this is the the scope of neuroscience i'm going to stop i have many more slides that i can show you but here's a brief example of how with very high resolution imaging in the mouse you know cortex we can study how connections are made and how they change how synapses are shaped and just to give you an idea each of these blobs is a synapse and this is part of one neuron in the mouse brain this neuron is about 10 microns meaning 1/10th the width of your hair and each of these synapses is about 1 to 2 microns which is about 100 the width of a human hair but with very high resolution microscopy in living animals we can make such measurements we can measure the activity of cells we can measure synapses we can measure networks and with all of this we can ask many interesting questions so i can give you if there is a question a flavor of how we do experiments in mice that can tell us about the dynamics of cognition you know and how is it that we know because in humans you can only study so much while we know these regions are involved with vision or with hearing what is it in them how is it that vision shapes activity how do we see what does it mean to make a decision the dynamics of neurons are the critical components of cognition and we can measure them not so much in humans but in animals and we can use mathematical principles together with the high resolution technologies to analyze how the brain encodes decodes represents and transforms information so sorry i went on for a long time <laughs> but uh, uh, i hope you got a flavor of uh, of the field of neuroscience what are our questions how do we think about them and i can tell you more thank you mere ganka you've left us a intrigued and now i have a question about my own brain and <laughs> something that happened to me for which i want an explanation from you so 25 years ago i was going home from my office at the university of maryland after doing a full days of calculation and i got hit by a car uh, which knocked me over i hit my head i was knocked unconscious for a very long time i don't know hour maybe until the ambulance came and uh, they put me in and by that time i was regaining consciousness and the nurse asked me for my name and i couldn't remember my name but i wasn't going to let her get away so i looked so i felt my wallet took out my id card and i read out my name to her i couldn't remember the name 
the names of my children, of my family, of my parents. I couldn't remember the name of the person I was working with. But I could remember the details of the calculation, physics calculation that I had been doing. <laughs> now, for the next three days, I was re-educating myself about names. And then, I don't know how many days later, it all started to come back to me. Slowly, slowly, it came back. Now, my question to you is, a part of my brain was perhaps damaged, perhaps it didn't get the blood flow. Uh, um, was it that new neurons were created or were, um, was, was there a diversion of the parts where proper nouns and names are stored? Look, I could remember the rest of my language perfectly. I could speak it, I could read everything, but I couldn't remember any names. So tell me what happened to my brain. Speculate, if you will. <laughs> the, the short answer is, I don't know. And I, 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 should, I, should, I should make clear, I am not a physician. I'm a scientist. But, and in fact, I'm an electrical engineer. All my degrees, including my PhD, is in electrical engineering. But you can see, even from my brief presentation, how the, how the language and the concepts of engineering or of physics are critical to understanding the brain. The brain processes information. And to come back to your question, Parvez, chances are, I am wildly speculating, that there was some stunning of the brain meaning that because you have a concussion this has been known in fact there are uh, there is now a growing awareness that even games such as football where you head the ball leads sometimes to concussion in fact professional sports leagues may europe may concussion protocol bana diya gaya hai ki yadi aap ye nahi bata sakte jab yadi aapne head kiya ya ya aapko chot lag gayi so, you ask question, you know, a physiotherapist, immediately. Sports field, what is the name of the sport? What is the name of the Usual questions of memory. So, memory is a very quick way to assess the state of the brain, particularly immediate memory. And Long-term memory and immediate memory are sometimes quite distinct things. Long-term memory is stored in many brain regions. They're made in the hippocampus, but stored across the cortex. And it is almost certainly the case in your case, I think, is that the brain got jostled, hence the cortex got stunned. So your long-term memory probably got a little bit suppressed. But then the interesting thing about the brain, we used to think that brain cells need oxygen. And after a few minutes, if they don't get oxygen, they would die. But we now know that they can get stunned, meaning they will get reduced function, but then they can recover. That's what I think likely happened. Whether or not new cells were born, I don't think so. Most brain regions in humans do not generate new cells. That is one of the amazing things about the brain. That is why when we have brain damage, the recovery is often very poor and limited. And that's because it's just not possible through evolution. There are reasons for this that we can talk about, that brain cells usually don't regrow. So that's my <laughs> very simple and a very uh, a non clinically informed, but research informed uh, uh, view of what may have happened to you. Let me follow that up with uh, something that is uh, perhaps something you can say more about being a neuroscientist. We all get uh, un, our uh, neurons from our genes. Those genes then um, uh, make us whatever we are. Now, 
are the different sections of the brain given neurons which are of different types or are they all of one type and can they be reprogrammed in some way or uh, is it that the part for verbs is different, the part for, for nouns is different as far as language goes, the part for seeing is different, the part for hearing is different. Uh, how much commonality is there? Because w when you drew that, uh, that neuron, you told us that the, the uh, structure is that of an axon and then that axon goes and meets up with synapses, there's a synaptic gap. Are all the cells, all these neurons the same or how, how different are they? Sure. So the fundamental way by which a neuron works is very similar from brain region to brain region. Every neuron in the brain has dendrites where synapses come in, a cell body, an axon that takes the spikes away and makes synapses with other cells. However, we now know that the brain probably has many hundreds of different kinds of neurons. What are they? One kind of neuron has a positive effect on the next neuron. These are called excitatory neurons. Another kind of neuron has a negative effect on the next neuron. What does a negative effect mean? It means that when this neuron fires an action potential, its target neurons become inhibited or less likely to fire an action potential. So these are two broad categories, but even within each category, there are maybe 100, maybe 200, maybe more different kinds of excitatory neurons. Some look one way, some look another way. In the cortex, there are different layers, they are organized differently. There is tremendous amount of complexity and different brain regions do have different kinds of neurons. Why? We think that's because they make different kinds of circuits that process different kinds of information and they are required for processing different kinds of information. In the hearing cortex, there are neurons that can fire very fast. In other parts of the cortex, there are neurons that have other properties. What makes a brain region unique and different though, we believe, is not only the neurons, but the inputs and the outputs. The connections, brain regions for processing vision, get different kinds of inputs from the eyes, through structures deep in the brain, and through hierarchical networks that allow vision to be processed so that by the time information from the eyes, you know, vision is only photons hitting the eye. There are photoreceptors in the eye. All information in the world has to be transduced into electrical activity by receptors. So we see because there are receptors in the eye that take photons and convert it into electrical impulses. This goes into the brain, to a structure deep in the brain, to the visual cortex, then to other cortical regions where these specks of light or the pixels of light from which photons that, that photons have excited in the eye get converted into elements of vision. There are neurons that are sensitive to orientation of light. There are neurons that are sensitive to faces even in the human brain. It's an astonishing thing. It's a progressive creation of the elements of cognition. So these neurons may be similar, but the inputs they get as they go along the visual pathway are different and these inputs get elaborated. That is a whole mathematical model, if you will, of how this may happen. And there is a big research agenda for testing these models through ideas like feet forward convolutional neural networks or integrate and threshold and fire and nonlinear processing, etc. Okay. So yep. the fundamental elements are similar, the inputs differ, the outputs differ, and the circuits differ, and that's at the heart of what a brain region does. Okay, I am going to let the audience now ask you questions, but before that, I need to satisfy my own thirst a little bit. <laughs> 
in computers, you have certain basic, basic circuits. Uh, you have input into them and output coming out. Uh, like say an adder or a half adder or uh, at a more fundamental level, AND gates, OR gates, NOR gates, NAND gates. Do you have such basic neural circuits as well? And what are they and have they been identified? And how did you identify? Very good question. So I gave a little bit of a hint of that. There are basic circuits in the brain that are used over and over again, but in different contexts. What are these? Some of these circuits are, for example, recurrent excitation. If you have two neurons and each excites the other, you can see that it will create a recurrent wave of excitation. However, you also need inhibition so that both neurons work within their dynamic range rather than sit in saturation. So this motif, recurrent excitation with inhibition imposed, is a very important motif for amplifying or for extracting certain kinds of inputs or information from inputs. Another is divise, division versus subtraction. If you have inhibition, it, it, it can help sharpen or shape the excitation that a neuron gets. And this is at the heart of creating a very important property, for example, of orientation selectivity. A Nobel Prize was given for, to Hubel and Wiesel now 40 years ago for showing that there are neurons in the visual cortex that respond not to spots of light or pixels of light, but to an oriented light and dark edge. This property is created by the retina projecting to the cortex through a structure called the thalamus, but then creating a specific circuit where the inputs line up, they are recurrently you know, connected, and there is inhibition that shapes it so as to create an edge detector. Why is it important? Everything you see around yourself is bounded by little line segments. So objects and object recognition is fundamentally enabled by oriented line segment detection. And so while pixels are what the eye tells the brain, the brain creates vision by the circuits built up of these elementary motifs that then create the elements of behavior or of perception or of, or in this case of vision, something as automatic as vision. You don't think about what you see, yet there are remarkable numbers of computations and circuits in the brain that enable vision, for instance. Ah. Uh, have you uh, finished explaining that point? Yes, I have. I have. Okay, but there's Sorry. something I Sorry. didn't understand because if your nerves, if your neurons are looking at particular orientations, what we see is a continuum of yes. Of place. <laughs> so, so uh, there are neurons that respond to one or the other or the other or other orientation in the first stage of vision, but then in the next stage, in the next stage, where you get serial inputs you are building up more and more complex properties. This is, this is one way by which vision works. There's also feedback so that vision is not just bottom up. Vision is also contextual. You have to recognize what you see. You have to remember, did I see this? So all of that is made possible by feedback projections from higher brain areas to the visual areas. Okay, now I think uh, we can take questions from the audience and uh, let's start from the back and move towards the front. Assalamu alaikum sir. Thank you for a good lecture here. So sir, I want to ask that I have seen a movie in which they use brain chips to help a paralyzed man walk again. So do you think there is any chance of it happening in real life? 
think. So in real life, I don't know about walking again, but using brain activity to control a robot or to even make a muscle move is definitely possible and is happening. Why do you want to do this? It is because of one fact that we just mentioned. Sometimes if you have an accident or if you have some bad thing happen such that the brain communicates with your body through the spinal cord. So the motor cortex, for example, that makes you move, let's say your hand from one part to the another, there are neurons that have wires that go all the way down to your spinal cord. Some of these wires are one meter long. Amazing. That is one neuron. And sometimes if there is an accident or, some, or, or a disease like ALS, then these neurons do not communicate if there is if 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 for example there's a bad accident and there is a spinal cord has been damaged or even severed you know cut then brain cells do not regrow they will not regrow to go past that cut in fact this is a very big area of research how to make them regrow however so when that has happened then the human being is paralyzed because the brain may be fine, but there is no way to communicate to the rest of the body and particularly send signals from the brain to make the person move. So a very active area of research is to read out, is to put electrodes in the brain of a human being, when maybe 100, maybe 200 electrodes in one region or in multiple regions to read out the electrical activity. What did the brain cell, what did the motor cortex neuron try to say, can we read it out? And can we then use it to bypass the accident, you know, cut and either stimulate the muscle directly or move something else, maybe a robot arm to let's say bring a cup or do something. And this is definitely happening and it is possible to do this. And it tells you that the brain's workings are not mysterious. This electrical activity that is generated in the brain can be read out, can be decoded. We can, we, can, we, can, we can mathematically understand what the activity is intended to do and use it to do something interesting or useful or what the person wants to do. Is the readout invasive? Yes. In the case of you know, there are different ways of reading out brain activity. Non-invasive ways are by putting an electrode on the surface, such as EEG. But the EEG is very crude. Below each EEG electrode, there are millions of neurons. There is not enough resolution, for the most part, to take the EEG and use it to do something useful. EEG is electroencephalogram. So to really understand brain processing and brain function, you need to read out the activity of single neurons or, or, or hundreds, if not thousands, of single neurons. And that requires electrodes in the brain or some other way, such as in my lab, we use optical techniques, lasers to read out the fluorescent changes in single neurons when they generate action potentials. And we can do this very fast and over thousands of neurons. And you need a certain critical number of neurons to make statistically correct readouts. Um, uh, hello, sir. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, if it's OK, three questions. Uh, my first one being, the brain treats itself as a child. It gives itself uh, uh, Emotions based on its, uh, uh, I forgot, uh, it g g uh, neuroceptors, dopamine, etc. I don't know all the names. Why does it do so? And do we see this in animals? Because the brain treats itself as a child. It gives itself a reward system. If it does something good, it gets a reward. If not, it gets punishment. Why is that? And do we, do we see this in other animals as well? Second, does the brain have a hardwiring? And if so, can we replicate that? 
and third in the slides you showed the patients uh, when the patients do the image they acknowledge that the left side exists the clock the clock may not have the left numbers but the clock was fully drawn as a circle the house uh, similarly with the house the house was not drawn but the house's land was drawn on the left side why was that yeah well, let me take it one one question at a time <laughs> so it's an interesting analogy that you say that the brain treats itself like a child i don't see it that way what you are talking about you know the brain has different modes of learning there is supervised learning there is unsupervised learning there is reinforcement learning and these are very deep and profound mechanisms that the human brain has but very many animals through evolution have preserved what are they what is reinforce reinforcement learning is perhaps the most important way by which a organism including a human child or a human being adult understands the world many things we learn by interacting with the world okay we may be told that red means stop and green means go at a traffic light but if somebody landed in this world they will figure out soon because if you go on red you will get horns and maybe even get hit or come close to being hit so it is a punishment but but when when is green and you go then you are rewarded by being allowed to go so the world is full of rewards and punishments and in fact a signal that says something is good and something is not good because that's the nature of the world is a very powerful mechanism for learning about the world the brain has evolved to exist in this world and to learn about it and to interact with it and to even shape it the, if there is one function of the brain why why do we have a brain why do we have a nervous system why did organism even the simplest organism there is a organism called a nematode that is 1 mm or half a mm big even a jellyfish in the in the ocean has a nervous system it is strongly believed that the nervous system evolved to interact with the world and life itself is a story of being in this world life exists on earth why does it exist on earth it exists on earth because of the conditions of this of this earth and it exists as a means of being in this world so the brain has mechanisms <laughs> for understanding the world for learning about it and for interacting with it and these learning systems you describe they are not just meant for children they are the way with every organism has evolved to learn and so now how does it happen this is a very interesting and exciting question in fact there is a great deal of interest in machine learning as to how can we use these systems to make machines learn and some of the most powerful ideas some of the deepest successes of machine learning has been in reinforcement learning where you, by interacting with the world you learn about it and you can make astonishing systems and there are transmitters in our brain called dopamine norepinephrine my laboratory studies the transmitter called nor norepinephrine serotonin these are ancient molecules that are made deep in the brain in the most ancient parts of the brain but that are critical for the functioning and the plasticity of large regions of the brain they are so important that you know what the most successful machine learning program is it is the program made by a company called deepmind that taught itself to play chess or to play other games like go it taught itself it was only given that this chess piece moves this way and the goal of the game is to capture the opponent's king with just these instructions and by just playing against itself over millions hundreds of millions of times it transformed its program through reinforcement learning and it was told go explore but then strengthen the connections in this multilayer network that make you win weaken the connections that make you lose from just this instruction 
it learned and it has overwhelmingly beaten the best human chess players by a long shot. Mm. So, you know, uh, 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 reinforcement learning is a very, very powerful mechanism by which any system, not just the human brain, but artificial systems, machine systems can learn. There are other kinds of learning, supervised learning. When you go to school, your teacher tells you, do, you know, write this way, don't write that way. And that's where you have a teacher and you can make, you know, artificial systems learn that way too. And they are also powerful. And the brain, of course, through culture, through, through our medium of instruction, uh, 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 we, we, we have supervised learning as another mechanism and the mechanisms for that are different. They don't necessarily involve dopamine and norepinephrine and neurotransmitters, but they all involve plasticity. And we have models for that, and we have the field of neuroscience studies that as well. So, uh, Miriganka. I don't know what yeah. the last part. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, go okay. Um, I, is, was there a last part? I don't recall. Oh, well. there was the last question as to why, when, this, when yeah. these patients have the parietal cortex lesion, do they recognize some things in the opposite part? You, know, It is true that it is not a complete loss of everything, but it makes the point that they do see. It is not that their eyesight has gone bad or they are blind in one half. They do see some things, but they don't give importance to it or they don't think it matters. And what matters and what doesn't matter, we don't have a good understanding. Why do they draw the full clock face but not the, the numbers? I don't know the answer to that. In artificial intelligence, you have neural nets where the nodes are given different weights. Is that something mm -hmm. that is taken from the actual neurons in a brain? Or is it something that's the creation of computer scientists? That's a very good question. I think it is inspired by neuroscience. So artificial neural networks are inspired by the brain, but their actual mode of functioning has only some superficial similarities with the brain. So the idea of a neuron, a neural network, 70 years ago, there were ideas of perceptrons and even the earliest artificial networks drew inspiration from the brain that there are elements that some inputs that the that the engine that the source of change has to be the connections or the connection that each element makes with the next layer that there are multiple layers these are ideas that come from neuroscience but then how do you change the connections what are the algorithm those have had their existence in computer science. And uh, for instance, one of the algorithms for changing a uh, connections based on supervised learning or even reinforcement learning is called backpropagation, where you generate an output, you compare it, and you take the difference between the actual and the desired output, and you, and you take that difference and you change all the weights all the way back to the first layer in the network in a systematic way. And you do this over and over again, and this is what then wires up a network. But you need lots of examples, you need lots of data, and that's where the analogy ends. Human beings don't need a huge amount of data to understand the world. Artificial networks do. So that's why they are statistical machines, as opposed to cognitive systems like human brains are. You know, I have a, I have a seven-year-old granddaughter. When she was three years old, she would see a cat or a dog and she will say, that's a dog. To train a mesh artificial network to do this, it's an amazingly difficult task. You need millions and millions of examples of cats and dogs because they frankly look quite similar. So all the subtle ways in which a cat differs from a dog has to be embodied in the weights of the multi-layer network. Whereas human beings have perhaps built in propensity and some examples are enough for them to draw inferences about the world yeah. and making inferences based on both 
a predisposed wiring, and that was one aspect of the question, which we do come into this world, not as a blank slate or not as soup, but with some propensity based on our evolution. And then development happens. Through development, we are exposed to the world, and the two together makes cognition. But Language. we don't need millions of examples. Language is, of course, the prime example of that. Language is a primary yeah. you know, example there's, of that. There's yeah. a question here. Yeah. Uh, awesome. yeah. My question is quite simple. That, by the way, good lecture there. I really appreciate it. My question is that when babies are like just newborn, they can't see very well. Is that the reason that they don't remember what happens as they were babies? Like, if some woman comes up to you and says that I held you as a baby, and you just don't even know who that woman is, so, is that? Uh, and my second question, if you don't mind, is that where are where are all these phobias and things that you fear are stored in the brain. Thank you. So uh, it is true that babies' um, vision is, is relatively poor in babies, particularly newborn infants, but then vision improves rapidly in the first year or two of life. And some of this has to do with the retina, becoming, having more, you know, cells, even photoreceptors perhaps, though I'm not sure of that. But then the connections in the cortex, which is critical for vision, also developing in the first uh, uh, months of life. It is true that babies see less well. Uh, 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 and this has been studied, not by me, but by many others. As to whether that is the reason why babies don't remember, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that we remember as adults or after the age, it, it has been described that before the age of three or four, the memory for events, places, and things, what we call episodic memory, doesn't fully develop. And my opinion is that because the connections in this structure called the hippocampus, it's a structure as big as my, as half my thumb, about two inches behind, two inches into the brain from my ear. This is a very critical structure for formation of memories. And then the memories get stored elsewhere via the electrical impulses that the hippocampus provides to the rest of the brain. So my view is that these connections in the hippocampus that are critical for memory have not yet grown. So, but that's just my speculation. I, I am not an expert in development of human memory. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's, that's one thing. Uh, 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 and, and my point was, because you can't see, it doesn't mean that you don't remember. There are many things that involve relative, it's true that you need to attend and there has to be acute perception or there has to be some focus for you to, to remember something. Focus in terms of paying attention to something. Otherwise, you won't remember. If your mind is drifting right now to, you know, uh, 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 what, 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 you know, how you are being delayed for dinner by this, you know, guy talking to me, then you will not remember anything I'm saying. Uh, 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 so, 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 you do need to attend to remember. Fascinating As talk. To where are, yeah, another uh, sorry for interruption. Here. Fascinating talk, sir. My compliments. And I wanted to ask, are there any exercises or foods that, that prevent the, prevent or delay the onset of uh, de mental diseases like Alzheimer's? And have there been any breakthroughs since the days of President Reagan? And what are the chances of you getting a Nobel Prize anytime soon? I can answer the last question first. I am not getting a Nobel Prize, not because I have any lack of respect for the Nobel Prize, but there are many of us scientists. Science is a community activity. And in some ways, I, I, I don't like the idea of one uh, or two people being recognized because all of us stand on the shoulders of giants. There is everything I have told you 
only a little bit is my own work, but I am trying to represent the field and the community of scientists. That is the amazing thing about science is that our, our knowledge in this community builds and builds and builds regardless of who we are or where we are. And, and there is this important aspect of science. Anyway, uh, Alzheimer's and cognitive decline is a very important and very powerful topic, very, very, very uh, 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 a critical issue for societies to deal with. And we have made progress. We understand that cognitive decline or Alzheimer's happens because of the loss of brain cells. You know, if you look at the brain of an Alzheimer's patient, even when they are alive and certainly after they are dead, if they have donated their brain or their families have, you can make brain sections. You are astonished by how much cell death has happened. Neurons have died. And that is a very critical contributor to cognitive decline, particularly in structures such as the hippocampus, which is important for memory. And memory loss is one of the first signs of cognitive decline. And that's because just like the hippocampus is a very susceptible place for epilepsy. The hippocampus is a very special structure that has high degree of synaptic plasticity, very complex patterns of activity, and is very susceptible to disease and decline. So Alzheimer's involves many brain regions, perhaps all brain regions, but some early on, such as the hippocampus, it is due to many things. It's due to the accumulation of toxic substances called amyloid, amyloid beta. It is due to the accumulation of harmful proteins such as tau protein in neurons that, that ends up killing them. It is due to non-neuronal cells like astrocytes and microglia eating away at synapses or not making synapses work well. It is due to blood vessels becoming narrower and not bringing enough oxygen and glucose. It is due to all these things, which is why it has been so hard to pinpoint one thing. It is even due to a propensity for certain genetics. You know, life involves genes, but then genes are not all of life because life also involves experiences and interacting with the world and brain activity. So a combination of these makes the propensity for Alzheimer's and cognitive decline happen. But is there a genetic propensity? In some cases, yes. So all of this makes Alzheimer's difficult to study. What is the propensity for? Perhaps it is to make A beta, this harmful substance, or to make tau, which is another harmful substance. So we are beginning to understand some of this. There has been, by we I mean the field, there have been some therapies that have been approved by the US Food and Drug Administration, and they target this substance called A-beta. To remove A-beta from the brain seems to help at least a little bit. But we are, very, but we are still far away from having a good therapeutic. Frankly, there is very few brain disorders or diseases that for which there, is, there are mechanism-based therapeutics. Brain disorders and diseases ca can happen early in life, and these are disorders called autism or di ne neurodevelopmental disorders. They, are, they often have strongly genetic causes, and they can happen late in life. Degenerative disorders like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, and they have many other causes. So that's a big, big picture of brain disorders and diseases and where I think we are. I believe we are with respect There is to another question the... here. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the uh, very uh, inspirational lecture, sir. Uh, I wanted to know what is the standard understanding of uh, free will in uh, neuroscience, uh, particularly if you could explain with reference to the Libet experiments, uh, where uh, uh, there was uh, it, uh, the calculation was made that uh, before the decision was made, the motor neurons came into action and something such. Uh, second, uh, do we have any understanding uh, of uh, the physical structure of uh, memory? How, uh, in what, uh, like in computers, uh, me uh, memory is in the form of binary code uh, that can be on magnetic tape or something like that. 
So what's the structure of uh, uh, visual memories or other such memories in, uh, in the brain? Yeah, very good questions. Very uh, uh, complex question on free will. So Benjamin Libet, L-I-B-E-T, that's how I pronounce it, uh, did this experiment where you could see that, you know, you ask a person to say, press a button. I don't remember the exact details of the experiment, but the point is before the button is pressed, that is measure that one can measure brain activity that precedes the actual action. That itself is not surprising to me because by the time you execute an action, you are moving muscles, you are moving a, 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 a glass to your lips, etc., to drink. But the brain has had many, many, many processes that have gone on. One part of your brain has told you, I'm thirsty. Another part has said, well, I have a glass of water in front of me. And another part has said, well, now move your hand to, to, to raise the glass to your lips. So those activities have preceded your actual action. And they have to. And I told you in my talk that brain function is actually slow, remarkably slow in terms of even the action potentials compared to, say, computers. They are orders of magnitude slower. So tens to hundreds of milliseconds of brain, you know, brain activity preceding motor actions by half a second, a quarter of a second, which is a long time, is very commonly observed. We study mice in which we make mice, you know, do certain things. We, we, we train them to lick a reward spout when they see something and not lick when they see something else. And we can measure brain activity as soon as the decision is made and well before the action has happened. And we can decode this activity and we can show how this activity goes from one part of the brain to another. So all of this is not so surprising as to whether this is free will or whether this is the predetermined action of large numbers of neurons that are acting in a specific way, that is a complex question that has to do with uh, 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 what do we define as indeterminate or as free will. And to the extent that all behavior, all cognition is due to the action of brain cells and the electrical activity and the subsequent consequence of that activity, I will have to say as a neurophysiologist that it is brain activity that is, is what makes cognition happen. But that just moving the question one, 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 one frame down. I will let it go at that. Yes. One last uh, question. Okay. Yes, sorry, go ahead. Um, there was a second part of his about uh, uh, the memory, but after that there'll be a... The memory, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. What does it mean to have memory? Yes, we can measure changes in synapses, changes in activity, and changes in networks as a consequence of a memory being formed, at least in animals, or even in humans, we can show changes in brain activity. So that is absolutely a physical substrate for memory. Which but is, is it digital? changes in the strength of synapses. Is it digital in terms of zeros and ones? Is it uh, like in a computer? No, I don't think so. I think that a digital an analogy, I mean, digital computers work due to the discovery and the, and the phenomena of Boolean algebra and its representation, easy representation in transistor logic uh, uh, with, with respect to zeros and ones. The brain is you know, has been crudely compared to a digital computer in the sense that an electrical spike is all or none. And to that extent, the information in brain cells or in brain networks is in the interval between spikes rather than in the height of the spikes. To that extent, brain information representation is digital, but then a synapse is demonstrably not digital. It is definitely analog. And the reason a brain spike is generated is due to the summation of hundreds and thousands of such analog inputs that then make or do not make 
the threshold that makes a spike. So it's a complex of analog synapses and digital spike generation. There's another question. Uh, thank you for such a jaw-dropping information. And uh, my question is, is that cyborg is, cyborg is possible in human life? And the second part of the question is, what is the short-term and long-term memory, and why a human brain lose on a certain age? Thank you. So cyborgs by cyborgs, I presume you mean human machine interfaced yes, yes, systems, right? And I think it is possible. We, I just gave an answer to how in many people now in the world, in many labs, if you have had an accident, you can agree to have, you have to agree because ethics, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 approval is paramount in all human work and experiments. If you agree to have a brain implant, then, the, then there are devices that can read out your electrical activity and decode it and use it for doing something interesting or different. And in fact, you may have heard, uh, you know, Elon Musk's computer, Neuralink, is geared towards enhancing human function by reading out brain activity and enabling humans to do more and better things. I am of mixed opinion about the ethical validity of that, but to the extent that people are thinking about such cyborg-like uh, outcomes, yes, it is, it is coming on. Uh, to the extent that these can be used to help people overcome some difficulty and there is ethical agreement, uh, uh, I think it will keep proceeding. One last question. Um, sorry. Yes. I'm sorry what your next question yeah. was, but I, I forgot. Uh, yeah, uh, I just repeat it for you, sir. Uh, what is a long-term and short-term memory and how... Sir, sir. Oh, yes, absolutely. Sir, thank you. So, yeah, yeah. These are, these are very different mechanisms. Short-term memory, if, I, if, you, if, you, if you give me uh, or if somebody gives me their phone number, then I might remember it for five seconds so that I can punch it in and, 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 and phone you or phone somebody. But I may not store it. But if something happens, if, if, if there is a remarkable event, even one time, if, that is, if, if it makes a powerful impression, I will remember it for life. So these go through different pathways. These go through different brain regions. And it is generally believed that to make a long-term memory, you have to have input to the hippocampus, make special synaptic changes that then are transmitted to the cortex and make, make synaptic changes there where they live in the context of either a sensory input or a motor action. One so last one of question. the ways the brain differs from a computer is that processing and memory are in the same neurons, unlike in your computer where you have a processor and you have a memory that sits in a separate card. One last question. Um, I have a question. If a two-year-old gets a toy, it sees that toy and every day I'll try to come back to that toy. But if you ask him later on, 20 years to 10 years later, it will not remember ever having that toy. Why is that so? You ask some of the hardest questions, <laughs> and, the, and the short answer is, I don't know the answer. <laughs> I think it is because of some of the things that we were just talking about, that, you know, episodic memory or the memory for people, places, things, objects, takes some time to develop because of the nature of synaptic connections and even axonal yeah. inputs okay. to critical memory-related structures such as the hippocampus. And that's the best answer I can give right now. Last question. Uh, for such a nice uh, and informative talk. Uh, I'm proud to share that I'm also working uh, on neurogenerative disease for their treatments, uh, especially for Alzheimer's disease. I'm uh, preparing some molecules and I have published a few articles on this. I just want to share with you and uh, want to know, is that true uh, that uh, NSAIDs uh, that are uh, that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and their, their derivatives, if the patient or uh, the people who are using uh, th these uh, drugs regularly, 
uh, that they can cause delay in Alzheimer's disease. And there's a relation with acetylcholinesterase and butyrylcholinesterase. These are enzymes related to this disease. Is that true? Uh, can you share something about this with us? Yeah, well, first and foremost, congratulations on your work. Researchers like you are heroes. And, uh, and, and, and I, I hope your community recognizes the, the, the extraordinary dedication and sacrifice and work that goes into being a researcher. As with, with respect to acetylcholinesterase, etc., it is true that some of the most important drugs that are currently prescribed, such as memantine, for for Alzheimer's, are essentially they their 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 job is to keep acetylcholine around for longer, prevent its degradation. So they have been powerful drivers of at least preventing memory decline because acetylcholine is such an important transmitter in the hippocampal or in the cortical memory systems. Uh, and that's all I can say at this point. I, I know, as you know, perhaps better than me, there is, uh, this is, these are very active areas of research, Alzheimer's, it's a complex disease with many different facets. And so anything that can even help a little bit should be pursued. Well, there are lots of questions still remaining, but I know that we have to let you go. Thank you, Miriganka. It was just fascinating. It was lovely to have you with us. But before you go, <laughs> what do you make of Roger Penrose's uh, belief that there's quantum entanglement which is responsible for really how our brain works? Do you believe any of it? You know, in science, something has to be falsifiable, as you know, you know, for it. Uh, 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 so uh, 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 it is possible. I mean, I will never say something is not possible unless it is falsified. So Penrose's ideas about microtubules and about phenomena at a very deep level that underlie these macro level phenomena. All of my talk has been about information, about spikes, about synapses, about memory, about you know, parietal cortex and internal representations. These are the phenomena of cognition. But are there mechanisms that go deeper than the neuron on down? I have spoken on neuron on up. They are, they are very likely. I'm amazed as to the progress of particle physics, for instance at levels that are way beyond our ability to observe with the naked eye or even with simple instruments, but they exist. And when the tools arise and the tools come about, then we will address these questions. And so that's, uh, uh, I am open to these uh, suggestions. They are levels and levels and levels of understanding the brain as of nature. And this is a very deep level that, that you know, Penrose remarkably has imagined. And we hope it is true, it will give us a deeper understanding, or if it is proven false, if when we have the tools to measure, uh, then we will make progress too. I think that's a very appropriate attitude to take on this. We keep an open mind on what lies at the deepest level totally. below. Yes. Totally. So okay. thank you once again, Miriganka. Absolutely splendid. Let's give him a hand, folks. Thank you. Okay, thank you very okay. much.